Hello there, everybody. I'm going to do something different today. Given the way certain Twins players got their revenge against the Yankees on Monday night, I figured I would start today's podcast with the hit single Gallo, released by Chris Towers, <laughs> featuring Chris Towers back in 2021. Please enjoy. Scott's at the deep end. Join Chris and I in his numbers will astound. The real of Chris Davis, what we trade at. Just trapped your week alone now. Cue up, up Gallo, Gallo. Just trapped Gallo, Gallo. Click on Gallo, Gallo. Just trapped your week alone now. Welcome in. So I know you're supposed to laugh at your own jokes, but. <laughs> It just makes me laugh every time. Welcome in, everybody, to Fantasy Baseball today on Tuesday, April 25th. Frank Sample joined by Scott White and the rock star himself, Chris Towers. Today on the show, we're going to recap all of Monday's action, talk about some struggling pitchers. Spencer Strider is amazing, team name Tuesday, and much more. Before we get started, please like this video and subscribe on YouTube if you haven't already. If you're listening on the audio side, download, follow, and leave a five-star rating. Thank you very much, Chris. With all that, oh said, boy, that was uh, good. For, for anyone who just watched or listened to that and they have no idea what's going on, would you like to explain? Uh, yeah. Back in the off season of 2021, someone sent in full lyrics to a parody version of "Shallow," the song from the major motion hit picture uh, "A Star, a Star is, is, Born, is Born," starring Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga. Uh, and I decided to record it both parts. Um, and like, I can do the, the Bradley Cooper part pretty well. The Lady Gaga part, <laughs> a little bit out of my range, <laughs> a, little a little bit, like maybe three or four octaves. Too your your, your to falsetto voice was cracking yeah. there at one point. It's so good. It is so good. Man. Uh, someone either tweeted at me or emailed in and they said, dude, you got to play the, the Gallo song today. And I was like, you're right. I'm going to lead the podcast with Gallo. It, it was I, I think what made me laugh this time was just where you started it. I had forgotten that I, I went went that high. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for that. Yes. So uh, for anyone who has just joined us recently and you heard that for the first time, you pro probably have no idea what, what's going on. Leave, leave a five star review. Yes, please do. It, it was amazing. <laughs> anyway, let's get into uh, Monday Night's Action. I don't believe what I just saw. That's right. Oh, my goodness gracious. Players of the night. Chris, let's start with you. Oh, we're going to start. We're going to go from something so beautiful to something so negative. We're going to talk about Chris Sale, who has just been an absolute disaster. And uh, I, I was leaving my softball game tonight and uh, someone on my team asked me, are we dropping Chris Sale? I hadn't seen his box score line, but man, five earned runs, five innings, one walks, zero strikeouts. Has Chris Sale ever had a start with zero strikeouts and five innings? That's that's something worth looking up. I'd be surprised if he hadn't because he's made a lot of starts, but two swinging strikes on 83 pitches in this one. I was looking at some quotes from uh, Chris Sale and Alex Cora. You know, Alex Cora it basically was like, well, the stuff looks okay. He's just, you know, you know, he, he referenced one plate appearance where it was like, slider down and in slider down and in batter fouled off like three of them and then he left a fastball over the heart of the plate and he got crushed and it made me it it sounded a little like cora might have been hinting that his like he was pitch, tipping his pitches or or something like mm -hmm. that yeah i saw a more direct insinuation yeah that. clearly he's not executing well right now um but chris sale it it reminds me a little bit of Gosh, this is probably 2018 or 2019 at this point. I think it's 2019, um, which was before he had Tommy John surgery. I'm not suggesting that it's like that, but it was when he had uh, 440 ERA and 25 starts. And we kept talking about it. He's getting a ton of strikeouts, which he's not doing right now. He was getting a ton of whiffs. He was. Yeah, I mean, he was before this start. He still has 30 strikeouts in 23 innings. Um, 
But yeah, it it reminds me a little of that where it's like there's not like an obvious culprit to explain why he's struggling. He's just not as overpowering as he once was. And when you miss your spots, when you're not as overpowering as you once were, you get hit hard. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm certainly worried about it. And more yeah. directly, I'm certainly worried about the like nine fantasy teams I have that Chris sales on. <laughs> but to answer your softball friends question, no, it's not I time. Probably to wouldn't. Sales. Yeah. I mean, we only need to go back to his last start to explain why not to drop him. He struck out 11. He had 19 swinging strikes. His average exit velocity was very low, low 80s. We know the ability is still in there. He's just, like you said, having some trouble executing right now. I don't know. Maybe some pitch tipping thing was going on at this start. I don't know. But it, it's not like his velocity was just suddenly down three miles an hour, and that's when, why he went from striking out everyone to striking out no one. Um, so like, I get it. The frustration, like I share the frustration this yeah, pitcher absolutely. I'm most invested in. This is the pitcher who heading into this year, I probably staked my reputation on the most. So I have a lot to lose with every bad Chris sale start. Uh, but I'm not ready to pull the plug. I mean, I, I, a, a thing and, and I was writing an article about this today, specifically with regard to the, the struggling rookies. It's April 25th. We're, we're not even at the end of the first month of a very long season. Pitchers have bad months and go on to have great seasons still. So like if, if there are signs that dominant Chris sale is still in there. And I, like I said, we just saw it last start. I think you have to ride it out with him for at least for another month to see if, if, if that version shows up again and uh, you know, doesn't mean you have to start him every time I get, you probably started him this time. Uh, the good news, I guess it's good news is that because Brian Bayo was sent down, I think they're back to a five man rotation, which means if you started sale, you'll get another chance with them this week. I, I am, I am. Chris, you're muted. I am I am putting that as good news, which I think is telling. Chris was trying to make some impassioned response to Scott. <laughs> oh, I was just good good news. You get another Chris Sale start this week. There you oh, go. Okay. The uh, uh the food was terrible and the portions were so small. <laughs> the I might have a much simpler explanation and um the Baltimore Orioles might just have Chris Sale's number. He has faced them yeah. three times. Dating oh, back to spring training, so obviously they've seen him a lot. Maybe they they know what to look for. Maybe he is tipping their pitches, and only they've figured it out. Perhaps, yeah, because he has allowed 18 earned runs over 13 innings pitched against the Orioles. That's two regular season starts and one in spring training that he got rocked against them as well. So the Orioles clearly have his number right now. And to answer your earlier question, Chris, I looked up his uh, career game log. It looked like. There was a six inning start with one strikeout, but I didn't see any starts where he only where he had zero strikeouts through five innings. So this is something that Chris Sale has never done before, and uh, he's getting crushed. He, he's allowing a lot of hard contact. He allowed a lot of hard contact in this start as well. But again, I kind of just go back to the Orioles have seen him a lot so far this season. I agree, not dropping him. If you want to bench him and say, look, I need to see two to three starts in a row where Chris Sale at least looks serviceable before I get him back in my lineup, I don't have a problem with that. But I don't think that you should drop him, even in shallower 10 or 12 team leagues. Scott, let's go over to you. Oh, my goodness gracious. Player. Uh, it's not really player of the night. It's like a kind of a weird situation that's going on right now. Well, uh, oh, my goodness gracious is what I said when I saw that Jordan Walker was out of the lineup for the fourth time in nine games. So, you know, he began his major league career with a 12 game hit streak. Since then, he's gone five for 26, which isn't great, but. It does seem kind of odd that, well, we should start benching him now based on that. Uh, and and I think, I think part of the issue is, is just a concern I had when you know there was still some question whether Jordan Walker makes the roster is where they're going to play him. They have a lot of other good outfield options, and I think, given that Alec Burleson got off to a nice start while while Lars Newbar was out, and Lars Newbar is back now. Uh, 
the Cardinals are just part part of it's they're just struggling to play everybody they want to play. And so Jordan Walker is is bearing the brunt of that right now when he's, you know, kind of cooled off a bit. So that's that's uh I, I think the simplest way of looking at it. And you know, we're getting we're all getting a lot of tweets right now, like, oh, is it time to give up on Jordan Walker? No. And you know, this is when I where I'd also remind you, as as I was just saying with Chris Sale, it's April 25th. Uh last April, Julio Rodriguez and Bobby Witt combined for zero home runs. Combined for zero home runs last April. They were both hitting, I believe, well below 200. So no matter what you could say about Jordan Walker's start to this season, to start to his rookie season, it's going better than that. It's going better than that. And, uh, you know, hopefully at this time last year, you weren't dropping Julio Rodriguez or Bobby Witt. Uh, now, I, I will add, and, and this was more directly what I was writing about tonight, is how many of this rookie class have made a substantive impact in fantasy and come anywhere close to making the impact we hoped they'd make. It's basically Logan O'Hoppy, who just got hurt. Uh, Corbin Carroll's been fine. James Altman's been a godsend. But otherwise, all the rookies have kind of stunk. And... Uh, As I was just saying in comparing him to Julio Rodriguez and Bobby Witt, I, I don't think you give up on the ones you're most invested in, like Walker, like Henderson, those really, really high-end types. You don't want to give up on them. You shun it. You're invested in them now. It's too late. You got to see it through. And, and, yeah, like, and, and like, there's a good chance, guys, that high-end will figure it out. But I do and this is a point I've been making basically since the pandemic shortened season. It does kind of feel like the high end prospects aren't succeeding right away as often as they used to. In fact, they're disappointing us probably more often than not. I mean, last year, two, two years in a row, I'm not even counting this year, two years in a row. Now we've had three top 10 type prospects just completely bomb in their first look at the majors. Last year, it was Spencer Torkelson, Riley Green, C.J. Abrams. The year before, it was Jared Kelnick, uh, uh, Joe Adele, and Andrew Vaughn. Like, completely underwhelmed us. As top 10, consensus top 10 prospects, the guys who are supposed to be the most trustworthy of all. And I can't help but wonder if... You know, I'm contributing to this too. If we need to stop hyping those guys so much and we just need to let them develop instead of treating them like they're huge assets right away. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's always tough with young prospects because you're always playing the upside versus risk game with them. And, and, and it's possible that the, the pendulum has just swung a little bit back more to them being risks, but it, it's always been, you know, you, you take Jordan Walker a hundredth overall, not because you think he's going to be the hundredth best player in fantasy. Well, you, you hope he's going to be better than that. Right. Yeah. That's you draft him because 20% of the time he's one of the 25 best players in fantasy. And you just live with the fact that 45% of the time he's not very useful at all. Well, and, 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 I, and I think we've gotten I think we've gotten a little spoiled by Ronald Acuna and Fernando Tatis and, and these guys, because you, you also think of like Vladimir Guerrero was OK, but he didn't make an impact for fantasy really until his third season. Eloy Jimenez, his second season, I think, was the the covid shortened season. He was very good, but then he had injuries the next year and, and struggled. And and so, you know, th there were still like not just superstars or busts there were guys who were just decent for a while before figuring it out but there was also like a lot a much higher success rate on the mid-tier prospects like the edward sure. julian michael bush types got getting called up were often becoming impact players right away too like we just we we endured a very long period 
where it seemed like there wasn't a huge learning curve between the minors and the majors. Mm -hmm. And now it seems like there is a big learning curve again. And I don't know why uh, coming out of the pandemic, when I feel like it, it started um, it. Okay. You could make the argument. There was no minor league season in 2020. All these guys are rusty, but I think we're beyond that at this point and it's still happening. And I, I do think it's just kind of a cyclical thing because you go back to when I first started doing this for CBS, uh, you know, 15 years ago or whatever, I was writing articles like, yeah, when these big rookies get called up, maybe don't go crazy investing on them because a lot of times it takes them a while to round into form. It, that That's an investment that's not going to pay off most of the time. And maybe we're back to that and we need to recalibrate for these young guys because uh, they're all letting us down. It also could be that maybe they don't need a full 162 games. Like maybe the learning curve isn't that steep. Maybe they just need like six weeks and then they get the hang of it. Like we saw with Julio Rodriguez and Bobby Witt, which is why I'm saying don't bail on them yet. Ezekiel Tovar. Okay. Maybe, yeah. uh, you know, um, even uh, Miguel Vargas in like a 12 team at Roto League, I would probably Tristan, want to hang on to, but Tristan Casas, maybe. Yeah. You could let him go um, play in a deep position. But, but the, 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 the more expensive types, the higher end prospects, the Gunnar Hendersons and, and getting back to the original player, Jordan Walker of the world. I, I think you, I, like I said, I think you have to let it play out and hopefully, hopefully they get in the swing of things uh, within a matter of weeks rather than a matter of months. And it certainly could be cyclical, like you mentioned, Scott, but I remember we had conversations during and after the shorten, the COVID shortened season. And I, at least I had this take, I don't know if you guys did, but I, I felt like the, the, the impact of not having a minor league season that year could last much longer than just, okay, one or two years of development. I felt like it could you know, hamper prospects for like the next five years. Uh, maybe I'm, you know, just being a little bit dramatic about it, but I, I felt like losing an entire year of production in the minors is such a big thing for these prospects. So, um, yeah, I, it, I, it kind of feels that way now. I mean, you know, look, we had a few guys break out last year, Julio, Michael Harris and Spencer Strider. Obviously every player is different. You can't just kind of group them all together. But as you pointed out, we, we have seen a lot of prospects fail yeah. since the COVID short. I, I, I for, for lack for lack of a better theory, I will accept that theory because I can't come up with a better yes. one. But I, I don't, I don't especially buy that theory either. I, I think the <laughs> the better way to phrase all this to sum it up in a the catchy, pithy way is just like progress isn't linear. Yeah, you know, Julio Rodriguez. That that's the the guy that I think we we can say that the most about because remember last April, the biggest issue for him was he was just remember he led the league in in called strike threes by like a massive amount last april he was just like he was partially getting squeezed he was partially just still learning the strike zone and then how to approach pitchers and once he figured it out he really figured it out and then yeah. paid off in, in a huge way and so if you gave up on him too early that was a mistake jordan walker was probably a top 100 pick when most of you took him we're not giving up on top 100 picks yet it's just even guys who don't have track records, it's too early for that. So just have a little patience. Yes, indeed. Oh, my goodness gracious for me. I am just going to talk about all those twins who got their revenge. I mean, most, most notably, Joey Gallo hitting a home run against the Yankees. I mean, I must feel so great for him. And then Sonny Gray, <laughs> former Yankee, too. I mean, you, what are you laughing at, Chris? Just the way you said it. I can't. I mean... Come on, like Joey Gallo had a terrible time in New York. They, like, there's no hiding it. And he goes out his first game against the Yankees. I think it's first game because they played them last week, but I think he was on the IL. And he hits a home run, so good for him. And he didn't just hit a home run. 110.6 exit velocity, 432 feet. He's got three home runs in six games since returning from the IL. He is striking out less. He's swinging and missing less. He is swinging at more pitches inside the strike zone than ever before in his career. His exit velocity, his average exit velocity entering Monday night was 100.3 miles per hour with a 33% barrel rate. So I hope you listen to Scott and you picked up Joey Gallo for this week because I know he was on the sleeper hitters list. He's 54% rostered, could still be out there. And uh, look, if he can get back to 
80, 85 percent of the player he was in his prime. I mean, we could get, you know, 30, 35 home runs out of him again. So, uh, look, I was someone that completely, you know, wrote him off. But so far, he's he's made me look foolish. Joey Gallo's looked very good. Sonny Gray has also looked very good. He kept it rolling up against the Yankees. Seven shutout, eight strikeouts in this one. 18 swinging strikes on 107 pitches. Nine on the curve, seven on the cutter. Uh, he limited the hard contact in this one as well. And so far through his, I guess he's made five starts, 0 0.62 ERA, 1.07 whip, over a strikeout per inning. He's looked really good. He's just looked rock solid, Sonny Gray has. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts. Uh, Scott, I'll throw it your way. Sonny Gray continues to keep it wrong. I guess you can call him a sell high, but we we just don't have many pitchers that are exactly performing this consistently. I, I think I would probably just hold on to Sonny Gray. It's it's hard to call any pitcher who's performing well for you, and, and there have been few who've performed better than Sonny Gray with his 0.62 ERA. Uh, it's it's hard to to move on from those guys. I know I suggested that with Graham Ashcraft yesterday, but Sonny Gray does have <laughs> inconsistent though his track record may be. He's had like seasons that were you know, putting him in the Cy Young discussion. So if, if he turned in one of those seasons this year, I don't think it would be the most shocking thing ever. And, and there's a key distinction between Sonny Gray and Graham Ashcraft. The results have been good for both. Sonny Gray's actually pitching. well. I, I don't think Graham Ashcraft is pitching well right now, at least not in the, in a way that is sustainable. Yeah. Yep. Yep. In terms of like getting whiffs and, and yeah, yeah, like what Sonny Gray's doing right now might not be sustainable. I want to be clear. Like we've seen a long enough track record here where we know he goes through fits and starts, but the way he is performing right now suggests that what he is, the results he is getting are real or somewhat real. Graham Ashcraft is pitching over his head right now. In addition to, you know, it's the difference between like a hot streak and just getting lucky. Yep. And I recently moved Sonny Gray inside my top 50 starting pitchers. Scott, I know you usually hit, um, you know, the rankings, update the rankings in, in midweek time. Do you think Sonny Gray climbs inside the top 50? Uh, I'd have to pull it up and see. I mean, just off the top of my head, I would say, yeah, probably. I, I think I think this rankings update I have coming up Tuesday is going to be the most extensive I've done so far this year, uh, would be my guess. And yeah, I probably should be hitting it a little more often than I've had been hitting it. That's been one of my regrets here early on. Just so busy writing content. It's hard to would get to you, it. Would you rather have Sonny Gray or Chris Sale rest of season? I'm going to still say Chris Sale. I think so too. All right. That but it feels feel less stupid. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> that's, that's a toughie. It feels really gross. Would you rather have Sonny Gray or Dustin May? Ooh, I like the rhyming scheme we got going on here. I would rather have Dustin May, but I can get Sonny Gray inside my top 50 looking at it. It's what just about Sonny that. Gray or Gray Son Rodriguez? I will take Sonny Gray. Sonny Gray there, yeah. I think but I think, I think Sonny Gray, Chris Sale, and Dustin May are, are all in a similar range. It's like once you get out to <clears> the top 25 starting pitchers from – 26 to uh, let's call it you know 45 or 48 that's just like one really big glob that depending on how they perform over the next couple of weeks they could really move up a lot or move down a lot so it's it's very interchangeable that group right now uh chris you wrote the song anything you'd like to add on joey gell uh yeah let's not like you know let's not over or under react joey gallo is what like 50 percent rostered right now 54 that's probably too low. Yeah. But I don't think like all of a sudden Joey Gallo is going to be a, a contributor in batting average. If if he hits 235 the rest of the way, I think you're thrilled. So let, let's keep that in mind. But um, what he's doing so far is very impressive. He's crushing the ball. We know there are a few players. There are maybe four players in baseball with raw power comparable to Joey Gallo's. And uh, he's locked in right now. Uh, let me ask you this. The comeback kids, Joey Gallo, Cody Bellinger. Mm. Who, who, who are you taking there? I think I have more faith in Gallo. For one, just... Well, that wasn't the question I asked, exactly. <laughs> Gallo. Okay. I, I like host Scott. 
<laughs> he makes sure that he gets the so, right well because I, I, I mean it's and, it's 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 easier to buy that gallo is what he's doing is sustainable i think but i'd rather have bellinger i think the the overall upside's higher the performance has been better so far overall yeah i would i would rather have bellinger as well i think the overall skill set is better for fantasy as well it's there's not as much variance involved although look <laughs> there have been lots Whoa. of strikeouts and a very low batting average recently for bellinger but he's making more contact much more contact than gallo this year I, and a big part of it for me is just Bellinger's struggles are have been going on longer. I Gallo was basically yes. like, let, let's remember how good Joey Gallo was when the Yankees traded for him, which was at the 2021 trade deadline. He had like a 900 OPS. Yeah, Bellinger no, hasn't really been that good in let's... like four years. Okay, you're talking about the difference between three years and four, two years and four? Two years, yeah. yeah that's, but, that's that's half as many years. But Bellinger's yeah, still in his prime. Bellinger's peak was better than Gallo's too. I, look, we haven't sure. seen that player in a long time. It, it's, I think it's a fair question. I, I would take Bellinger though. Um, anywho, let's say, hit our first break. And when we get back, we'll talk about Spencer Strider. He was amazing. And I don't know if there's much to add. And Alex Cobb threw a complete game. We'll get to uh, both of those right after this. A Paramount Plus subscription is now included with your Walmart Plus membership. Tell the world what happens when they cross me. For no additional cost, members get a mountain of entertainment. Are you accusing me of something? This is great! Sign up for a Walmart Plus membership and watch all of this and more with your Paramount Plus subscription. I'm gonna trust you on this. Welcome back. And we, have you ever dreamed about owning some fantasy baseball today merch? Well, now you can with the Paramount Shop, which offers a mountain of merch from the Paramount shows and movies that you love. Shop official apparel, drinkware, and accessories inspired by over 150 fan favorite titles Paw Patrol, Yellowstone, Top Gun, Star Trek, South Park, SpongeBob SquarePants, and your favorite CBS Sports podcasts like Pick Six, Fantasy Football Today, and of course, fantasy baseball today scan the qr code in the top right corner if you're watching on youtube or head to paramountshop.com paramount shop where products are paramount let's talk about spencer strider who took a no hitter into the eighth inning on monday night up against the marlins he went eight shutout two hits zero walks 13 swinging strikes with 31 wait what did i say 13 strikeouts not 30, 31 swinging strikes that's what he had on 101 pitches Fantastic. Seven, 17 of those on the fastball, 14 on the slider. He leads baseball with 47 strikeouts. He has nine plus strikeouts in each start this season. Scott, how many pitchers would you rather have than Spencer Strider rest of season? Mm, well, prior to this start, I had four ranked ahead of him. After this start, maybe two. I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm in baby. Okay. So there's still, there's still the issue of, can he sustain this over 180 innings? Because we've never seen him do that before. But I think given the, given the shortage of innings, given the shortage of pitchers who are delivering consistent results on an inning by inning basis, I don't know. I think that's a standard that I'm, I I'm, about ready to move on from as well. I've been pushing the the innings thing for a f good number of years now uh, at the expense of of uh, of you know overwhelming bat missing ability. The th the kind of thing that's going to be more eye catching in fantasy, uh, as you know, s perceiving it as a market inefficiency. Like everybody can look at Je Jeffrey Springs ratios and say, "Aha." breakout candidate look at all those strikeouts but you know if everybody's doing that then that drives up the cost and it's you got to find an efficiency some other way and so i was doing it with volume um but this year i mean like i said it's only been a month and maybe things could change but it's i i've i've been questioning that approach more than i have in a long time and just like take take the good pitching when you can get it and if it gets hurt at some point, if it if it slows down at some point, okay, worry about it then. 
But there's no guarantee of that happening, first of all. And there's no guarantee that the durable guys are going to remain healthy. So, so yeah, third. You, you said third. All right. So, yeah. Garrett Cole? Yep. You have him ahead of Spencer yep. Schrader? Yep. And Corbin Burns? That's it. Uh, I'm hedging there with, like, Sandy Alcantara. He's up there, too. So I, I, I guess refutes everything I just well, said. And, and he, well, because I think there's another case. Yeah. Is Jacob deGrom worse on a per inning basis than Spencer Strider? Well, I'm so confident they might, DeGrom that is might miss... just be that might just be the Spider-Man meme. Yeah. You know, but like it's also like I I I always struggle with it because like I, I agree with you, Jacob deGrom seems very, very likely to get hurt and, and require missing time, but like if he doesn't, he's probably a better bet for 190 yeah. innings than Spencer Strider. He's done it before. Yeah. I, so like if, that if that's when I some struggle miracle, with. He doesn't get hurt and he's just he's never hurt. Then yes, the Rangers are going to let him pitch enough to break like 180, 190 innings, sure. I really struggle with I think Strider over McClanahan. Okay, that makes sense at this point. I mean McClanahan. It's like McClanahan is another example of my larger point where I I I got scared off by him, you know, kind of slowing down in September and, and mm-hmm. what would the innings look like. And now I'm regretting that because he's actually a really good pitcher. He is really good. He's awesome. Yeah. But you know, similar innings concerns, probably less pronounced than Strider, but they're they're there. And Strider's at like a full calendar year of being basically a 40% strikeout rate guy, which is just absolutely bonkers. Uh, McClanahan's very, very good, but he's like seven percentage points behind that. Listen, listen, Shane McClanahan yesterday got 32 swinging strikes. That's one more. Yeah. Spencer Stratton yeah. only had 31. Come on. <laughs> Unless overall pitches. Come on, Chris. This, this swinging strike rate goes to 11. <laughs> 17 swinging strikes from Strider on the fastball. What was no, I just sh- saying yesterday about Logan Allen, a pitcher I, who can get whiffs on his fastball? That I that. think Strider, McClanahan, Degrom. I think like Cole Burns. I'm just going to put them in a different tier. Okay. I think there are okay. There are reasons to be a little concerned about Burns because of the the issue, the injury issue that he had. But I still believe. I think then there's like a little tier. DeGrom and Strider and, and McClanahan are all like right there. And honestly, I mean, Shohei Otani might be there too. So you're, yeah. you're kicking, you're kicking out Contra out of this discussion altogether. <sighs> I'm, I, I don't I, know yet. I think Sandy is behind those names. The it's way just, I mean, certainly on an inning for inning basis. So it's, it's like, how much are we going to yeah. disregard the volume thing? He just, he might throw 60 more innings than those guys. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. that's in, po- I, I think it's a points versus Roto thing potentially. Mm-hmm. We did have a an email from someone named AB. He had a keeper question regarding Spencer Schrider. Ten team head to head categories. You keep eight players. He was receiving Julio Rodriguez, William Contreras, and Lance Lynn for Spencer Strider, Adley Rutschman, and Brandon Lau. Ten team head category. Repeat that one. Giving up uh giving up Strider, Adley Rutschman, and Brandon Lau. <laughs> Getting Julio Rodriguez, William Contreras, and Lance Lynn. I, I'd do it. I'd get I'd get Julio. I think so, but that's really tough. Yeah, because uh, I think you're getting the best player, and you're probably giving up the next three best players, both in redraft and head to and dynasty. I, you know, it makes it easier for me because it's a ten team league. But sure. Yeah. No, it's it's a it's a it's a it's not an easy call. I get a, like it's a C plus for me, the getting Julio Rodriguez. The other pitching standout from uh Monday night, he did it in a very different way than Spencer Strider did. Alex Cobb threw a complete game shutout, six hits, one walk, four strikeouts with four swinging strikes on 109 <laughs> pitches. He allowed 12 hard hits in this game, although his average exit velocity was still very low. So uh, I guess gave up a lot of hard contact, but also induced a lot of soft contact. He's got a one nine one ERA, a one two seven WHIP. I don't really know how to explain this, start Chris, but the fact of the matter is that the overall numbers for Alex Cobb have have been good this year. They've been not, not great, but they've been good. Um, I I think 
you explain this start with bleep happens. Like sometimes you just, you give up a bunch of hard contact and you don't, don't get a lot of swings and misses and it doesn't really bother you. And, but I, I think overall what he's doing remains, you know, pretty decent. Like he's getting a decent amount of strikeouts, 26% strikeout rate, not walking anybody, giving up a lot of hard contact. That's kind of the Alex Cobb story, but like the splitter, the slider and the curveball all getting whiffs overall. Um, I, I don't think he's a superstar or anything, but like Cobb has had sleeper appeal for several seasons in a row and he's underperformed and maybe he's just getting a little, a little positive variance this time. Hey, we need serviceable pitchers any way we can get them. So if, if that's who Alex Cobb is, we'll certainly take it. The underlying numbers certainly like him too. 2.83 FIP, 2.92 XFIP so far this season. So uh, I think, look, just continue to roll with him. As long as he's healthy too, that's another thing. You know, Cobb usually misses time, but as long as he's healthy and pitching like this, you just continue to roll with him. Let's talk about some pitchers who were not good on Monday. And that'll take us to Nick Lodolo. Uh, I mean, we hit between him and Chris Sale. To, for anyone out there who had both Chris Sale and Nick Lodolo in your lineup together, as in multiple team. leagues, <laughs> oh my you've God. dropped to last place in ERA. I had, I had another, I had another one with Chris Sale and Edward Cabrera tonight. So oh, it's really, my ERA in one league is up to five point six five. It's been awesome. I'm really enjoying myself. Well, let's talk about it. Nick Lodolo has now gotten destroyed two starts in a row. He was up against the Rangers at home in Great American Ballpark. Four innings pitched, nine hits, six earned runs, two home runs allowed in this one. Uh, the thing is, the average exit velocity was not terrible, but you know the two home runs that he gave up, you only got to give up two that hard. Yeah. 107 miles per hour off the bat. It's like when things spiral, spiral for Nick Lodolo, they just really get out of control. His last two starts, he has given up 19 hits. 14 earned runs, five home runs total. The ERA has now ballooned to 6.31 on the season. Scott, what are we doing with Nick Lodolo? I think we are disappointed right now. But two starts ago, we were very happy. We were thrilled with Chris, uh, with Nick Lodolo. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, I don't. I don't see any like red flags here to make me think, oh, he's not going to be good now. I think it's just this is happening to most pitchers. <laughs> it, it, it's you know it, it hasn't necessarily been the last two turns for each of them, but I mean, remember how Chris Bassett's first start went? He's been pretty solid since then, but that first one was a disaster, and uh, nobody is immune from that. Uh, I'm looking up the home runs that Nick Lodolo allowed to see if they were like Cincinnati. No, no, no. They're, Scott, they're both they're both they, to Josh. They were bombs. Yeah, they're both to Josh Young, and they're both bombs. Yep. Yeah. Uh, over a 900 expected batting average on each. So, yeah, they're bombs. But as you pointed out, Frank, the average exit velocity, unlike his previous start, the average exit velocity on the, 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 on the whole for Lodolo was good in this start. And I think he'll bounce back from it. I'm not, I'm not concerned. I'm just disappointed. Mm hmm that's such a dad thing to say <laughs> uh, for Lodolo, by the way, I don't want to wish this upon anyone, but Chris, I, I get a hint, a hint of early career Robbie Ray vibes from Nick Lodolo. Lots of whiffs, lots of strikeouts, hard contact, walks, home runs, bad ballpark. Just saying there's, there's a hint of it there. A hint. Yeah, the control for Lodolo hasn't really been as much of an issue. Uh, but yeah, when he gets hit, he tends to get hit pretty hard. Um, you know, 383 expected Woba on contact two years in a row. That's a little higher than league average. So it's not like, I don't know if that's like a silver bullet that I can point to and say, okay, yeah, this explains why he's on underperforming. I think in in this instance, it's probably just he made a couple of bad pitches over a couple of starts and we'll, we'll mostly be fine. But, you know, it it's not the ace turn we were hoping for yet. But the expected ERA, 355, a lot better than the 499 or 631 actual ERA. So uh, I, uh, I'm, I mostly agree with Scott. Not too concerned yet. I'll tell you what. He faces the Oakland A's this weekend in Oakland. If that goes bad, then 
I think we might be singing a different tune when it comes to Nick Lodolo. Lance Lynn, another subpar outing. He was at the Blue Jays. Five innings, four runs, three walks, four strikeouts. Gave up a three-run homer to Kevin Biggio. Of all players, of all Blue mm -hmm. Jays, Kevin Biggio. Kevin and, in the woods. Ah, uh, gosh. The, the walks have been a big issue, Scott. 4.4 walks per nine this, this season for Lance Lynn. When he went on that stretch last year in the second half, 13 or 14 starts, he averaged around one walk per nine. And I knew that wasn't sustainable. But to start this season, he's kind of gone all the way the other way right now. Uh, your thoughts on Lance Lynn? Yeah, I'm just not that worried about him still. It's it's funny because on, on the days he's starting, I, I'll, you know, someone or two will tweet at me, oh, I guess it's time to drop Lance Lynn now, huh? And I'll be like, oh, shoot, what happened to Lance Lynn? Thinking he had some kind of Nick Lodolo start, you know? And it'll be like this. He gave up four and runs in five innings. And by 2023 standards, I'm just kind of like, eh. You know, I, I could live with that. I, I understand the ERA still comes out high, uh, but I, I don't know. I don't feel like uh, I don't get the same feeling of dread looking at a Lance Lynn line as I do with some of the other pitchers. His swinging strikes have been great. He had 14 again in this start. It's the second highest swinging strike rate of his career behind only last year. Uh, so I, I think he's going to be fine. Just kind of early season um, sluggishness. And uh, he'll catch fire soon enough. Chris, how would you rank the the main three pitchers that we've talked about today struggling in terms of the the likelihood that you will buy them? Try to buy low. Chris Sale, Nick Lodolo, Lance Lynn. Lodolo, Sale, Lynn, I think is the order that I would go there. I think. Okay. Uh, I would be looking to buy any of them right now. Again, it has to be on the cheap. You know, you don't want to yeah. pay any draft day value, but I certainly would look to buy low on, on all three. A couple other names that struggled. Jose Urquidy, uh, he gave up six earned runs over two and two thirds at the Tampa Bay Rays. I mean, the Rays are just a buzzsaw right now. Edward Cabrera mm -hmm. took a step back as well. He's He was at the Braves. It's a really tough place to play. Obviously, tough lineup. Four and a third, four runs, four more walks for him. His walks per nine this season are... Uh, <laughs> Eight over eight, yeah, yeah, eight. almost eight. nine. Yeah, he has twenty walks and twenty-two innings pitched. That is just, I don't care how good your stuff is, it's just not going to work. Chris, what are you doing with these two? Her Jose Urquidy, Edward Cabrera. I would prefer not to drop them, especially Cabrera. But it's the kind of thing you know we talk about it a lot. But if you have a two-star week and you can't start a guy in a two-star week, that's not a must-roster player. And so, like. Justin Steele was another two-star pitcher this week. I had more confidence in Justin Steele than Edward Cabrera. I don't know if my rankings reflect Justin Steele ahead of Edward Cabrera because I do think there's still that untapped potential with Cabrera, but that's a change in my rankings I probably need to make uh, if if I'm at that point. So, yeah, I, I would rather not drop Cabrera. I think still think there's a lot of upside there, but I don't know. It's so hard because it's just like just fix the one thing, right? It's It's easy. Throw just, strikes. Just don't walk well, people. Just stop well, you know doing he, that. He threw like 50% changeups in this one at last time out. Mm -hmm. And then he got back to use his normal changeup use in this one about 33% of the time, which meant more fastballs, which is the pitch he can't throw for strikes. So which like so he's, he's, weird. He's he's shown the the formula for success. He's he's shown he can deliver on it, Edward Cabrera. But although but can you trust him? I mean. In this outing, only 15% of his changeups were in the strike zone, which that's yeah, not necessarily just a, you know, that's not the only thing that matters. You can get strikes while throwing out of the strike zone. Framer Valdez famously barely throws in the strike zone and, and doesn't walk a lot of guys. It's just Edward Cabrera hasn't proven he's that kind of guy yet. Mm -hmm. Let's take our final break, and when we return, we'll get to some news and notes. Uh, I've got some something about the Rays that I want to point out to you guys. Uh, team name Tuesday, and much more right after this. Meanwhile, on Paramount Mountain. Okay, we have the northern face, the southern face, and... The Sylvester Stallone face. Stallone! Of course. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? Is that Dad? Uh, yeah. No, 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 don't sneeze. Oh, dear God, no. Hold it! Hold it. Don't do it! No! Ha! Gesundheit! Thank you, man. You're welcome. 
Welcome back. Let's hit the news and notes. Jordan Alvarez is dealing with neck discomfort and has been sent back to Houston for tests, which does not sound very good. The Astros had Corey Jolks in left field and Yaner Diaz at DH on Monday. Sandy Alcantara has officially been cleared to start Wednesday after uh, at the Braves following a 25-pitch bullpen session on Monday. Chris Bassett left his start due to lower back tightness and sounds like he'll be good to go his next time out. Michael Harris has been cleared to start a rehab assignment and is expected to be activated this weekend against the Mets. Congrats to all the Dodgers players who are seemingly having babies at the exact same time. Max Muncy and Bruce Dar Gratterall were both placed on the paternity list on Monday, joining Evan Phillips, who is still on it. Sounds like Phillips is going to be back on uh, Tuesday, though. As a result, top prospect Michael Bush was recalled for, uh, for the Dodgers. He was batting 337 with two home runs in 21 games at AAA this season. He had 32 home runs in the minors last year. Scott, obviously, this is a prospect that we like long term for fantasy, but I just don't know that he's going to stick around. Uh, yes, I agree. Michael Bush is who we're talking about, right? Yep. Yeah, I've I've been waiting for this day for like three years. The Dodgers have really slow played Michael Bush. He's already 25. Um, But yeah, I I would suspect because because where is he going to play if once once Max Muncy returns? uh, By the way, all these Dodgers going on going on a paternity leave at the same time, like. A lot of Dodgers getting busy during the All Star break. Let's see it last year. I'm, I'm just going to put it that way. <laughs> he's, he's not wrong. It was, it was uh, yeah, was a uh, fine homecoming for them. Um, yeah, back to Bush. I mean, back to Michael Bush. Um, <laughs> he. Uh, one thing I've noticed about Michael Bush during his climb to the majors. <laughs> Is that he'll you, you look at the track record and the batting averages are kind of meh, a lot of walks, a lot of power. He gets to a level and he really scuffles at first, but then he returns to that level the next year and he just goes bananas, which is happening this year for him at AAA too. Uh, and so that makes me wonder how that's going to play for him when he finally does get a decent run in the majors. If he's if it's going to be the same learning curve for him. So all that to say. I'm not really that interested in picking up Bush. He's an interesting player. And uh, if he does stick around, obviously my interest will go up. But I I think it's going to be maybe even uh, a shorter stay than Edward Julian got. All right. Lucas Giolito was placed on the bereavement list, but should make his next scheduled start Friday against the Rays. Mitch Hanniger made his debut Monday night for the, made his Giants debut Monday night, uh, batting third in the lineup. Christian Walker has missed two straight due to a left forearm injury. He suffered from a hit by pitch over the weekend. I think I he did enter that game as a, I think a pinch runner or maybe a pinch hitter. I think it was a pinch hitter. It was in a pinch. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Luis Severino threw two up and downs on Monday and will throw again on Friday. Chris Bryant was back in the lineup Monday, batting third and playing right field. He missed two games with a lower body injury. The D-backs option Dre Jameson to AAA on Monday. They'll eventually need a fifth starter, uh, which could be red and fought. And speaking of which, uh, mm-hmm. Tommy Henry made a, his debut on Monday, made a start, and he was not very good. So, man, if Brandon fought is just like okay, people are gonna roast us. <laughs> and we have never <laughs> talked about a oh. prospect as much as we've talked about Brandon fought the first three not weeks of this. Us. It's not just us. I, I think we've been more tempered in our approach to thought than than most fantasy analysts out there um chris we need pitching man we need pitching any way we can get it so no i get it and and like the bids for taj bradley and mason miller were crazy in these 15 team leagues that uh that the experts like playing in but i no, i mean to chris's point um i like the i i like thought i i think you 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 obviously have to grade his triple a double a numbers on a curve because of how hitter friendly those uh, uh, affiliates are for the Diamondbacks, and between him, Ryan Nelson, and Dre Jamison last year at AAA, Fod was by far the best. He had more strikeouts last year than any minor league pitcher has had since 2001, I believe. Uh, so I do think there is upside here. But you know, what I was saying about rookies at the start of the show during the um, 
oh my goodness gracious player like it, it applies to pitchers too and that we can't assume they're just going to hit the ground running when they reach the majors it's probably it's more likely than not going to be uh a a learning experience for them and so you, you shouldn't put all your eggs in the fat basket at a really during a really difficult time for pitching in general all right kenta maeda will make his next start wednesday against the yankees he left his last outing after getting hit by a comebacker jose siri is likely to be activated on tuesday he missed some time with a hamstring strain luis arise has missed two straight due to a left knee bruise brian bayo was optioned back to triple a which means a tanner house rotation spot is safe for now the blue jays are called nate pearson from triple a and he'll join the bullpen uh, he could provide some big strikeouts. So if you play in a deeper league and you're just desperate for some kind of ratios or strikeouts, Nate Pearson might make sense for you. The Rockies optioned Ellie Harris Montero to triple a. So Scott, I know you were looking for an excuse to drop him. There you go. Drop him. Yep. Um, Matt Bush was, excuse me, placed on the IL with a, with right rotator cuff tendonitis. Darren Ruff was placed on the IL with right wrist inflammation. There goes my uh, first baseman in NL labor. Bailey Ober was optioned back to AAA following a solid start over the weekend. Logan Ohapi will undergo surgery on his torn labrum Tuesday. He's expected to miss uh, four to six months. Luis Medina will be recalled and start Wednesday for the A's. He came over in the Frankie Montas trade. And Scott, you know, once was, uh, Medina once was a, you know, he had prospect pedigree, but walks are a big issue. Lots of strikeouts, but just really cannot, can, it does not have very good control. Yeah, I'm not expecting much from him. Would much rather have Brandon Fott. Yes, I think we all would. Uh, Orioles' top prospect, Jackson Holiday has been promoted from low A to high A after playing just 13 games. I, like, What's the earliest we could see him? Like Late next year, if they're super aggressive? Is, I don't know. Is that even possible? Yeah, it's possible. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the Reds promoted pitching prospect Andrew Abbott from double A to triple A. And he's a name that should be on your radar because he has been, I know it's only been three starts, but in the minors this season, 1.15 ERA, 0 0.57 whip, 36 strikeouts over 15 and two thirds innings. That almost sounds impossible yeah. to do. So. I mean, it's, it's, you know, if you missed out on Mason Miller, maybe Andrew Abbott's the next best thing. It's, it's different because at uh, Mason Miller has that big 102 mile per hour fastball. Abbott, when you watch him pitch, it's like, why is this guy missing so many bats? He, like he has, uh, he has the vertical approach angle that helps to optimize, like, the modern fastball that rises in the zone. Like he, he does that to perfection and he pairs it with a good breaking ball. And it's just, it's just eating minor league hitters alive. And now that he's up at triple a, I mean, Andrew Abbott, I, I think he's definitely in the discussion for a call up at some point this season. Uh, I, I don't know if it's to the point where you need to stash him already in a standard size league, but, but don't be surprised if we're talking about Andrew Abbott as a pickup at some point. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's talk about the Tampa Bay Rays, who are off to an amazing start. 20-3, and three, including 14-0 and 0 at home. I just wanted to point out, I think they very clearly focused on launch angle this offseason because we talked about it with Andy Diaz. We mentioned it the other day with uh, Harold Ramirez. But if you look at Wander Franco and Randy Rosarena, it's the same thing. Career low, 34% ground ball rate for Franco. Career high, 46% fly ball rate for him. Randy Rosarena career low, uh, 44% ground ball rate, career high, 38% fly ball rate. So, Chris, it's very clear to me the Rays had a organizational philosophy this offseason to improve launch angle. You know, time will tell whether or not it sticks, but as of now, that that's kind of why they're off to the start that they are. Yeah, it's like we've talked about with Yandy Diaz. I think it's true of Wander Franco. If he sustains this, I, I think the breakout is – clearly real it's just a question of whether he can sustain it and I, I think every passing game makes us a little more certain but what's happened so far is an imperfect predictor of what will happen in the future and so i've moved both franco and diaz up in my rankings so far but i'm not ranking them as if this is real yet all right well let's stick with the rate uh raise and just mention what Taj Bradley did in his third start. Five innings, three runs, six strikeouts to zero walks. 
And uh, he gave up two earned runs in the first inning, but seemed like he settled down after that. Really leaned into his cutter in this one, 45% usage. Scott, it just felt like watching him that he didn't really have the four-seam fastball or the curveball in this one. And even with that, he was, he was still able to come away with an okay start. Yeah, I'm sorry. Who was this we were talking about? Taj Bradley. Okay. Uh, yes, it was interesting the way he upped his uh, the way he changed his pitch mix leaning on the cutter a lot more and even though the velocity was down on it so we, we clearly didn't see the best Taj Bradley in this outing and yet the result was decent enough I'd still feel good about my investment in him all right let's uh hit a few waiver wire hitters where do these need to be rostered if anywhere Josh Young went two for four with a double dong and uh, he's batting 282 he's got five home runs so far and 824 OPS the strikeout rate is slowly creeping up every time I check it it's up to 31% now uh, Chris 70% rostered is Josh Young where does he need to be rostered I think that's about right you know if you're if you need a third baseman in a in a shallower points league you know he he did hit two home runs today and like we talked about a lot last week with some player whose name I'm blanking on we there's always the not just the is this player worth adding, but the opportunity cost of not adding them and coming off a two home run game. You know, there's some opportunity cost in not adding Josh Young now. So I think it's worth taking a flyer on him, but 70% yeah. sounds close to right. I remain highly skeptical of Josh Young as long as he's striking out 30% of the time because he just doesn't impact the ball hard enough, I think, to get away with that. Few players do, but uh, yeah, I, I'm. If if I'm relying on Josh Young as my third baseman right now, I might be looking to swap him to another team, uh, somebody I trust more, maybe even pairing him with somebody to to upgrade. All right, a few other third basemen here. Spencer Steer went two for four with a triple, two runs and two RBI. He had three hard hit balls all over 100 mile per hour exit velocity in this game. And uh, J.D. Davis went two for four with his fifth home run. He's batting just over 300. Scott, who do you prefer between those two, Davis and Steer? And uh, what size leagues do you think they need to be rostered in? I prefer Davis at this point. I'm, I'm getting that that 2020 feeling all over again as far as liking J.D. Davis goes. I guess that's a weird thing to say. But, um, yeah, I think they both need to be rostered in standard Roto leagues where you have the extra lineup spots to fill, the extra corner and field spot to fill. And so they're both, you know, maybe a little under-rostered considering. Uh, you know, I would I would roster Josh Young over both, but between him and Davis, it's it's closer for me than you might think. All right, a few outfielders here, and uh, Mike Yastrzemski, two more hits. He's now batting two eighty. He's been you know pretty hot over the past week or so. Jerkson Profar, he's uh, trying to get going. He went two for five with his third home run, striking out a little bit more this season than we've seen in the past. And uh, Brent Rooker. A double dog yeah. for the Oakland A's in that game. He's 32% rostered. Yeah, Chris, Chris, how would you rank this group? Uh, these are clearly, you know, five outfielder league options, but Yastrzemski, Profar, and Brent Rooker. Uh, I don't know how I rank them. I haven't given that enough thought yet. <laughs> Profar is my favorite in a points league. Rooker's really interesting, though. The quality of contact numbers are quite good and then you you look at the plate discipline and you see the i think it's 72.1 percent contact rate on pitches inside of the strike zone which is on swings on pitches inside of the strike zone which is really really bad that is one of the it would be one of the five worst marks in baseball this season just below aaron judge so it's clearly not a killer you can survive swinging and missing that much Brent Rooker is not Aaron Judge, but his quality of contact mm -hmm. metrics are quite impressive. Uh, right now, he's his AAA numbers. He has like I think it's sixty-one home runs in two hundred and eight games. There's legitimate pop here. Mm -hmm. So i I don't know how much is here, but it's not zero uh, interest in Brent. by the by the way. Shout out to Jose Suarez who. Jose Suarez alone, not the whole Angels pitching staff, but just that one pitcher gave up five home runs to the Athletics lineup. Yeah. He gave up two to Brent Rooker, two to Jesus Aguilar, and I think one to Kevin Smith. So that's uh, 
It's pretty hard. It's pretty hard to accomplish that. Scott, does Matthew Boyd matter at all? He had his best start of the season at the Brewers. Five innings pitched, two runs, eight strikeouts, two home runs allowed. It's like the classic Matthew Boyd start. 19 swinging strikes on 87 pitches. He's only 38% rostered, uh, and he does have RP eligibility. What do you think? Yeah, I almost made him my OMGG player. Uh, obviously, he needs to go deeper than five innings at some point, but this was... It, it had been kind of a weird start to the season for him. He, there were some external factors that I think were holding him back. This this was the first start where he showed kind of what he was showing this spring in terms of his bat missing ability. And he is throwing a change up a lot. It, it He's throwing a much more effective change up now in terms of swing and miss ability. He's not throwing it a ton. But he's throwing it enough that I think it's helping his fastball to play up too. He always had a good slider when we saw him get big strikeout totals in the past. I think he has a fuller arsenal now. So I'm very interested in Matthew Boyd. And um, I don't think he's must-add or anything. But if, if I'm already invested in him, I'm not looking to drop him after this start. That's for sure. All right. Let's get into some bullpen updates for the Orioles with Fe Felix Bautista unavailable. Yanir Cano struck out two for his first save and... Uh, I've seen some pitching ninja gifts of this guy, and he is nasty. Uh, so, uh, just a name to know. Like, we don't want anything to happen to Bautista, but if if anything did, it, it probably would be that guy. For the Rangers, I think I know why they haven't been using Jose Leclerc, and it's because he stinks. He entered. <laughs> in, <laughs> he entered in the eighth with the bases loaded, up two runs. He walked two, which tied the game. He then started the ninth inning. He walked Jonathan India, and then Will Smith came in, and he allowed a walk-off single walk-off rbi single to tj friedel so that i don't know i still think will smith is will smith has been solid for most of the year but i, I don't think that their bullpen is very good the uh, texas mm. Rangers. for the tigers alex lang pitched a clean ninth struck out two for his second save and uh outside i think he's had like one bad outing but outside of that he's looked really really good so 39 percent rostered if you do need saves that's alex lang for the Diamondbacks, Andrew Chafin entered in the eighth inning with a runner on first. He walked one, then gave up a game-tying RBI single. The Diamondbacks retook the lead in the bottom of the eighth. Uh, Chafin came out for the ninth, which he then closed it out, so he wound up with the win. I guess he's their highest leverage reliever, but he's been kind of shaky recently as well. And then for the Blue Jays, Jordan Romano pitched a clean ninth inning for his eighth save that is tied for the league lead with David Bednar and Josh hater to stream or not to stream let's start with tuesday peyton battenfield versus the rockies nope eh, probably not kyle bradish versus the red sox i'm okay with that one i, I, I have a lot of confidence in bradish yeah that's fine i think so too bailey falter versus the mariners nah josiah gray at the mets nope eric lauer versus the tigers sure Mason Miller at the Angels. In Roto. Yeah, in Roto. I mean, there's there's no harm in having him in your lineup. I just don't think it's going to be an especially impactful well, start. Nick Lodolo is here <laughs> to remind you that there there is some harm in having any pitcher in your lineup. Right, but like if you're if you're going, eh, whatever. If, if I, I think if in a daily league, if you have Mason Miller, you might as well use him, probably He's regardless of the matchup. Not a single A starting pitcher has recorded a win yet this season. And Ken Waldachuk had a seven to one lead at some point on Monday night. Did not get, he didn't get the win. The A's got the win, but he did not get the win. So poor guy. Um, Griffin Canning versus the Oakland A's. High risk, high reward. I'm mm -hmm. pretty excited about it, though. I think I'd yeah. do it. Yeah, I think so too. Ryan Nelson versus the Royals. You could do worse. Mm -hmm. I don't love it. And Brady Singer at the D-backs. Nope. Nope. On Wednesday, Domingo Herman at the Twins. It's fine. I don't love it, but I don't hate it. The The Twins do swing and miss a lot. So it, it might work out for Herman, but it's risky. Kenta Maeda versus the Yankees. Nah, not coming off all the health stuff. Tyler Wells versus the Red Sox. Nah. Not buying him. Yusei Kikuchi versus the White Sox. I could see myself doing it if I really wanted to maximize volume. Just don't think the White Sox lineup is that good. Yeah, I I don't 
I don't have any confidence in Yusei Kikuchi one way or the other. Michael Kopech at the Blue Jays. I would not. Me neither. Rolandi Contreras versus the Dodgers. No. No. Marco Gonzalez at the Phillies. Nope. I Taiwan. am starting him in one league. Oh, gosh. Uh, Taiwan Walker versus the Mariners. <laughs> That's okay. So. Mackenzie Gore at the Mets. Nah. Would prefer not to. Michael Waka at the Cubs. No. no. Drew Smiley versus the Padres. No. Meh. And Steven Matz at the Giants. No. Meh. Team Name Tuesday. This one's from Craig on Apple Podcast Reviews. She turned me into a newt. Mm. That's a good one. Spelled like newt bar. A newt? It's a visual well, joke. I, I got better. <laughs> from Great Ryan. Uh, no baby puts Escobar in the hot corner. Gotcha. Oh, gosh. That's that's, that's a heath too, one. Too clunky. Uh, yeah, I, I knew you'd hate that one, Scott. Uh, from Felix in Panama. All right, shout out to Felix. We appreciate you listening. Uh, nobody puts Bybee in a corner. <laughs> Yeah, it, it worked better if he didn't pronounce his name that way. Yeah. Nobody puts Bibby in a corner. <laughs> yeah. From Kevin, the softer side of J.P. Sears. Oh, that's a new one. Yeah. I like that. That's good. From Joey, let Qui-Gons be Qui-Gons. I like this, but it's not a baseball thing. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I, I, gen, I, watched, right? <laughs> I watched the Phantom Menace the other day, so I'm here for it. But I didn't I, know if there was something I was missing here. <laughs> I don't think. I mean, maybe there is. Let us know in, in, the, in the comments or whatever. But yeah, I, I don't. Uh, I, I think that's just the Star Wars one, which hey, I'm here for it. Yeah. From Richard, was thirsty, glass now empty. That's, that's solid. <laughs> yeah, that's solid. From Andrew, Otani's boys. I don't, I don't know. Oh, like oh Otani okay. boy. Like, Otani boy. Yeah. The pipes, the pipes are calling. Yeah. We're just bookending with beautiful singing from me in today's are, episode. Yeah, much better at this than I am. Uh, Book of Boba Shet. Yep. Yeah. From Scott, not Scott White, the Los Angeles Angels of Jonaheim. I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> good. That does appeal to Scott, though. That's very clever. From David. More Jameson, Maeda, Puck. <laughs> but what? it's like an E in parentheses. More Jameson, Maeda, Puke. <laughs> it's, I, I, yeah, because like Jameson, the alcohol. Yes, yes. Oh, the, I guess I haven't yeah. heard of that one. <laughs> From Jonah, living young, wild, and freed. Sure. It, it, yeah. You really need somebody whose name sounds like... I know I don't like cramming too many names into a team name, but if you're going to get Young and Freed in there, you need Wild to be somebody too, I feel like. I-M-H-O. From Dana, Drew Waters broke. She's going into Glaber. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I like that one a lot when I read it. Amazing. Uh, these last couple are all Brandon Fott teams, so uh, here you go, Chris. I hope he's great. From Mike, let's play the Fott game. I don't, I, know, I don't know what that's for. I don't get that one. Let's let's play the fought game. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't From either. Patrick, fought bottom gurriers. <laughs> that one's good. <laughs> that's a good one. From yeah. Alfonso, drop it like it's fought. Yeah. Uh, this was the best to team name Tuesday so far. Definitely. <laughs> good last, job, guys. The last one is it's getting fought in here. Yeah. I like those. Sure. Yeah. Hey. I hope it works out so we can uh, continue to rock with these. Uh, before we wrap up, somebody left a four-star review on Apple 4, not 5, uh, because they said my bye bye at the end of the show is very, very annoying. Ah. So I guess we're going to have to retire it. Bye bye no. <laughs> We're going to wrap there. For Scott and Chris, I am Frank. Thanks, as always, for tuning in to Fantasy Baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. We'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>